Good morning, everyone. You can stand with us as we begin today's service with scripture. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 4. It says this, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. This is God's word.
seated. Well, good morning. Good morning and happy Father's Day to those dads among us. Hear this word from 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That is what we are. The good news of the gospel, the good news that we say transforms us to be rooted in Christ, connected in community, and engaged in mission, the good news that God saves sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that's what we build our lives around as a church. That good news is that each and every one of us, despite the fact that because of our condition and because of our choices, have set ourselves at odds with our creator God, that creator God would make himself known to us. And one of the ways he chooses to make himself known to us is as a father through a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that you don't have to be an outsider struggling for belonging, trying to make your way in life, trying to scrap and claw for meaning, purpose, and identity. But you can have the true belonging that your heart longs for through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And those who put their faith in him, the Bible says, are called sons and daughters of God. And that is good news for each and every one of us. I want to welcome you here to our service this morning. We're glad to be together. If this is uh, your first time here or you're newer among us, we just want to welcome you. We know it's hard to step into a new place, into a new community, and that takes some risk and courage, and we're just glad that you took that step this morning. We'd love to get to know you either after the service around a cup of coffee, or you could introduce yourself to us by way of the connecting card in the pew back in front of you, and you can fill that out, and we'll be in touch with you uh, throughout this week. So thanks for being here. Um, a number of things that are happening among us. Um, one of those uh, is that this week uh, we're going to have a special uh, discipleship training from one of our missionaries who you're going to get to meet in a few minutes. Um, on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, we'll be meeting out here across the, the hall in the fellowship hall. This is open for everybody, and it's special because we have a special missionary here with us to do a training around God's heart for justice um, and what it looks like uh, to serve the Lord uh, by carrying out the justice of our God who cares deeply about that um, in the world. And so this would be a great training, a great opportunity that's coming up on Tuesday night, and we'd love to have you uh, be part of that. Uh, we had a great week last week. Those who were at the softball game, I was asked this morning, in case you were interested, I did hit a home run. Uh, thanks, thanks to Pete, who was playing uh, real short. Um, they, they let me have that, that win. So thank you. Thank you all. We had a great time together as a church uh, family. Thanks for all who came out for that. Uh, event on Sunday. It was a great time to be together uh, as a family. Speaking of families, uh, family camp is coming later in the summer, uh, the second to last week of August, the 23rd to 25th. It's family camp weekend edition, and so we want you to make sure you're saving the date, bookmarking that in your family calendar so that you're ready for that time. It's going to be a great opportunity. One of the things I love about family camp is it's an opportunity for all of us uh, to serve together, and there'll be a special uh, focus this time around on equipping parents in discipling their own children. And so we're really looking for those of you who are in high school and college and empty nesters uh, to be able to help out serving so that parents can be involved uh, in the training that we'll be doing for uh, parents. One of our other identities, as you know, is that we are ambassadors. We're Holy Spirit-empowered witnesses of Jesus in the world. And uh, one of the ways that we try to live out that identity is not just living on mission, each and every one of us in our communities, in our homes, in our, and in our, our neighborhoods, but uh, by partnering with those who the Lord calls uh, to go to some of the un most unreached and hardest-reached places uh, in the world. And this morning, we're going to get to hear from the Walsh family. Uh, the Walsh family, uh, they're missionaries in East Asia. Um, and because of the work they're doing in a moment, we're going to have to pause the live stream um, so that they can tell us more fully and forthright uh, with the, the minute. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. No one of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This 
Find someone you don't know especially and say hello to them this morning.
All right, you can uh, return to your seats. Our scripture reading uh, this morning is from Galatians 6, 1 through 10, as we continue our series in Galatians called Freedom in Jesus, looking at the freedom that we have through the gospel, through what Christ has done. Galatians 6, verses 1 through 10. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual Restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, each one of you looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have a reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load." The one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap a reward if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may you guide us in our minds today to understand your word, to see Jesus clearly through this text, and to grasp hold of these truths with our whole heart to be changed, to look like Jesus a little bit more in our character, in our values, and how we live our lives. And I ask this in his name. Amen. I've heard it said before that church would be awesome if it wasn't for all these Christians. And that sentiment gets at, I think, some important things that sometimes the hardest things about our faith are not necessarily the things that the Bible teaches or the things that the Bible calls us to and and how to live, but that the hardest thing about church is that it's filled with people and we're broken. When we're sinners, we can be selfish, we can be cruel, we can talk behind other people's backs. And that can make living together as the people of God, very difficult. Dan talked about this last week. The reason why it's so difficult and why church can hurt and why it can be hard is because in the heart of each of us is this struggle between what is called the flesh and the spirit, as Dan went in more depth last week. The fact that there is still a part of us which is self-focused, self-centered, that there is still this old us that while it's dead and and crucified through Christ, we sometimes want to, as I've heard it said before, uh, grab the old man and borrow it for a minute. And so we live in a a selfish, self-centered way. Or we can live and walk by the Spirit, be guided by the Spirit, have the God's Holy Spirit Uh, lead us in how we are to live our life and live in a way that's life-giving and building up the community. And so what this means is that every church, because it's made up of people, is a community, and every community then is either trending towards being healthy because we are choosing to walk by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, to be guided by God's Spirit, and so we have the fruit of the Spirit, like love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Either our community is exhibiting those characteristics because we are choosing to live by the Spirit, or we are choosing to live by the flesh, choosing to live by ourselves, and so our community can trend towards being unhealthy, and we have the divisions, the outrage, the lust, the greed, and the divisions because we are living by the flesh. And that's what stands before us. 
But what Paul is concerned about in this letter to the Galatians is that we can live in the life-giving freedom of the gospel, the life-giving freedom that comes through yielding to the Holy Spirit and then live out the life of the Spirit together as a church. And that's what he really turns to here in chapter 6 is how do we live together as a community? How do we live together under the guidance and reign of the Holy Spirit so that we are a healthy community which is growing together to look more like Jesus and we're loving each other well? And first of all, what Paul tells us is that how we live out life in the Spirit is to humbly restore one another. To humbly restore one another. Look at verses 1 through 5 with me. Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. If anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Paul takes for granted that we will still struggle with sin as believers in Jesus. We will not be perfect until eternity. And Paul says, look, there's going to be people, maybe even yourself, that struggle with sin and get caught in a trespass, caught in, in sin. Now, Paul does not have in mind here like little things that happen like once or a personality quirk or abrasiveness in our speech because 1 Peter 4, 8 says that love covers a multitude of sins. So there's certain small things in our life together where we just need to forgive. We just need to say, ah, you know what? It's, it's just a small thing. Oh, I'm going to show love, and we're going to overlook that. Otherwise, you become real nitpicky with each other, and that's aggravating, right? But what he's saying here is that there is a sin that can begin to dominate one's life. You get caught in it. The image is like an animal that's caught in a trapper's net. And you get caught in it and all tangled and you, you can't find a way out and it's beginning to destroy your life and hurt others. You're caught in a trespass here. And so what Paul says is when you see that happening, it says those who are spiritual should go restore that person. When you see your brother or sister flailing and drowning in sin, you jump in with them to restore them. Now, Paul does not have in mind two classes of Christian here. There's the spiritual people and everybody else like us. That's not what he has in mind. I think to help us understand what Paul is getting at in this verse if you think about this adjective spiritual, if you capitalized it, I think that would be helpful to know the meaning because what it's talking about is a person that's led and guided by the Holy Spirit. And what Christians are led and guided by the Holy Spirit? All Christians. All Christians have the Holy Spirit all Christians can be led and, guide, led and guided by the Holy Spirit. So he's not saying there's the spiritual and the unspiritual. No, he's saying if you're guided by the Spirit, you will go help your brother. You will go help your sister. You will go towards them as they're making a mess of their life, and you will humbly restore them. It says restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. When you see someone doing something wrong, when you hear stories of a friend or maybe a fellow brother and sister in Christ that's doing things that's hurting themselves and hurting others and, and being disobedient to the Lord and things are not good, uh, you're probably, maybe you're tempted like I'm tempted, where my first thought is not to be gentle. When I hear these stories, my first thought is to be judgmental and critical. It's like you think like, how could they do something so stupid? Why would they do that? They know better. Don't those thoughts come into our mind? And Paul is saying, that is not the way that we should be thinking about each other and treating each other. And that's not the mindset we should have as we move towards 
one another. We are to restore one another in a spirit of gentleness. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I've seen a single instance in my Christian life when a believer who's been caught in sin has ever been restored through guilt and shame. We must restore one another in a spirit of gentleness. Now, this doesn't mean that we refrain from speaking hard truths or rebuking or saying things that are needed to be said and pointing out where people have gone wrong, but it's kind of like cleaning a a very precious and expensive item that you have in your home that gets stained. You may have to scrub hard and with something somewhat abrasive to get the stains out, but you're still going to handle it in a very gentle way so that you don't break it. And I think that's what Paul is kind of getting at here in an image we can use to understand his words, where he's like, we need to view those people in the body that are struggling as those for whom Christ has died, as his precious image bearers, and we handle it with care. So while we may have to say hard things, we can say hard things with gentleness. We can point out and confront sin with gentleness in order to promote restoration. Because the goal of all of this is a restoring back to fellowship and a relational closeness back into the body. It's not to score points. It's not to merely prove that we were right, but it's restoration. It's to include them in the family and to be close with one another. We must humbly restore one another. But the only way we can really restore one another, or I think a lot of times people will be receptive to being restored, is through humility. And Paul makes this, I think he goes on at length here, challenging both the snob and the busybody in these texts when we go to restore. He says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. What he's saying here is watch over your own life. When you move towards others and seek to restore them, that's dangerous business because we can fall into temptation. One of those is to be a hypocrite. How many people have you seen where they espouse family values and then they live exactly the opposite way? It comes out in the news, right? So we can be confronting people and dealing with people and saying, oh, this is awful that they're doing, and we're doing the very same thing. But I think what Paul is also saying here is, watch out that you don't become prideful. Watch out that you don't think you're superior than this person. They're caught in sin, but you need to watch out for your own life that you're help restoring them with the proper attitude. He goes on to talk about humility here. He says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. The burdens here, I think primarily that he's talking about bearing, is this burden of sin and restoring one another. That's the context, although I think burdens could mean many other things as well. But, you know, you cannot bear burdens. The images of wearing, let's say, a super heavy backpack, right? You see those kids in school, they got the thick textbooks, and they're like, ugh! falling backwards. Well, to help them out, what do you need to do? You got to come close, get your hands under the the books, and lift and heave. Or if you've ever helped someone move, right, with a big piece of furniture, you got to get close to them, get up underneath it, and lift it up. And what this means is to do that, you have to be close to them. In those instances, is physically close. But what I think Paul is getting at here is to bear burdens, you need to be relationally close with people. You cannot bear burdens online. You can't bear burdens from a distance. It does not work. So we must draw near to each other, but do so in humility, because he says if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What Paul is getting at is saying, don't think you're better than these people you're trying to help. That's the snob. He's confronting that person that says, well, I don't want to get involved because I don't want to get my hands dirty. I have this nice functional life. My family is a good family, and I don't want those people to be 
infecting my life. What Paul's saying, nah, you got to get close. You got to get messy. You got to get in there and you got to help each other out in the body. Don't be standoffish because really, if you think you're so important, you're nothing. <laughs> we can deceive ourselves to think that we're better than we are. Re- because really, the only thing that separates us, right, from the world, first and foremost, is that we're forgiven. We were not morally superior to the world. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is not that we're better than others and God is like, oh, they're pretty great. I'm going to pick them. No, the gospel is that God in his own mysterious will is like, they're just as bad as everyone else, but I love them anyways. That's the gospel. And so we can't think that we're so much better than others that are in sin that we want to be standoffish. We're nothing. And so we go help one another. But then he also confronts the pride of the busybody. It says, but each one must examine his own work, then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. I think what Paul is getting at here is like there's some people in life that, you know, they have the the four principles that you need to fix your life, right? Like they have the blueprint and the plan that know exactly what you need to do. And actually, that blueprint and plan is not just for you, but it's for everyone that they encounter. And so they get up all in everyone's business and saying, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. Hey, if you don't want to mess up this way, you got to do this and you got to do that. And they're not attending to their own life. What Paul is saying here is you need to look at your own life and don't think that you're better than others because you're dispensing this advice, but you're carrying your own load. Watch out for yourself. Don't compare yourself. You're going to stand before the Lord on our own, on your own. Faith is a communal thing where we are part of a family, but ultimately, faith is something that each one of us must make a decision to believe in Jesus for ourselves. We cannot believe on other people's behalf. We can't repent of sin on other people's behalf. We will stand before the Lord ourselves, and so we need to examine our own work, our own life, to make sure that we're not um, turning a blind eye to where we're falling short while we're dispensing advice to everybody else. And so if we come towards others with this attitude, right? Like, think about how this would change our relationships and how this would change how we love each other. That instead of coming with a condemning voice of guilt and shame and being critical and thinking we're better than one another, we come in humility towards each other. That we're willing to get into the mess together. We're willing to get up under the burdens together and we're going to be there. Thick or thin, no matter what. The good, the bad, and the ugly, we're just going to be there. And we're doing so not because we think we know better, not because we have all the answers, but because God is good and he has called us to live a holy life and we care about one another. Wouldn't that change things? To be restored, though, those that are caught in sin also need to have the mindset to want to be restored, to to want to come back. And I think that one of the things that often hinders us from doing so is shame and guilt over our actions. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 when they were found out by God. The first thing they did was run and hide. They tried to cover over their sin through their own efforts because they were motivated by shame. But St. John Chrysostom was the Archbishop of Constantinople in the 300 ADs, 300s AD. And he had a really good way of summarizing what the Bible teaches about being restored. And he says this, Be ashamed when you sin. Don't be ashamed when you repent. Sin is the wound. Repentance is the medicine. Sin is followed by shame. Repentance is followed by boldness. But Satan has overturned this order. He has given boldness to sin and shame 
to repentance. What he's getting at here is we get it all twisted. We think it's like this shameful thing to confess our sins to one another. We think that it's this shameful thing to repent and want to turn from sin for one another, and so we don't do it. And what he's saying is that's completely backwards. Yes, you should feel bad about sinning. He says, be ashamed when you sin, but there should be no shame in confession of sin. There should be boldness, because we are forgiven by Christ. And so we should want to move towards confession and move towards repentance. But Satan, he gets this all twisted up, and we deceive ourselves, and we think, you know what? Sin looks pretty good. Sin is the way out. Whatever problem I'm dealing with, Obeying God is not the way, but living for myself and doing this thing, which I know is bad, but that's actually going to provide the answer for me. And so Satan gets us all twisted and thinks we need to go that way. We do it with boldness, and then when God brings conviction, we feel ashamed to confess it. But the point of church is not to kick anyone out of church. The point of church is to humbly restore one another back to the gospel and back to each other so that we can love together. Yes, things escalate so much, but I think in the 10 years that I've been on staff here, I think we've excommunicated like one person because they're a destroyer. But that's not the goal. The goal is restoration. The goal is to love one another and bind each other's wounds the goal is to, when you see your brother or sister driving on a flat, to be the spare tire for them. The, the goal is to, when you see your brother and sister broken down on the side of the road, to turn around and go get them, to pick them up and bring them with you on the path of repentance and restoration. And if we live like that, we will be a healthy community. Paul also goes on to say here in verses 6 through 10 that we need to generously support one another. So we need to humbly restore one another, to move towards one another with truth and kindness in a spirit of gentleness to bring us back to the fold, to bring us back to the path. But he also goes on to say we need to generously support one another. He says here in verse 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. More or less what Paul is saying is that your generous financial giving supports the work of ministry. The plain reality is that everything that happens here at the church, my salary, Dan's salary, this building, all the ministries is supported by your generous donations, by your generous giving. And Paul says that's right and good. The church is to support the ministry of the word. It is your donations, it is your generous giving which supports the work that we heard about earlier in the service, does it not? Right? These are good things because we are all together as one family and we're to support one another and your generosity is the driving engine of that. I think so often we get tied to that we need to give a specific number, and I don't think that's really the point that Paul is getting at here. I think the, the point is a spirit of generosity. And when you imbibe a spirit of generosity, that affects you no matter where you go, in what stage you're in, and how much money you're making. Too often we think, well, I gotta get to, to this number, and when I get to this number, then I'll give to the church, or I'll give to ministry, or I'll be generous. And Paul, I think, is saying, no, no matter where you're at, you should be giving generously. So even if you're a broke college student, I would encourage you to give and give generously. Because it's not the sheer amount that matters, it's your heart. And what I see in the Bible is that when Jesus, he talks about money more than almost anyone in the Bible, but Jesus never says, he, he never puts a, a, when you arrive, then give. He just says, give, and the Bible elsewhere says God loves a cheerful giver. So, just as an example, my wife and I, we give about 10% of our income, 
It's like, well, Chris, aren't you paying your own salary? Well, I guess, but, um, you know, it's about the spirit, right? Um, And so that's what we do. We find that to be a helpful benchmark. Maybe it will be helpful for you. Um, But again, I don't think that it's uh, about a certain percentage or a certain number per se. It's about the attitude of the heart. But God wants more than your your wallet as well. And he gets at that in verses uh, 9 through 10. He says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are the household of faith. So Paul moves here to talk about more than finances. He says, "Good, do, do good, and be generous, persevere in this, keep doing good, keep supporting one another. So what good can you do today? Maybe that's a helpful question to ask yourself when you wake up in the morning. What good can I do today? How can you do good to your spouse? How, uh, what good can you do to your kids? What good can you do for your friends? What good can you do for your employer? What good can you do for the world? Paul has this idea that we are to be doing good and supporting each other, right? In verse 10, He's like, do good to all people, but especially the household of faith. So what Paul has in mind here, I think, is of all communities that should support one another, it should be us first. And so as we're supporting each other, as we're doing good for each other, then it creates this virtue cycle where we kind of get things spinning. The, 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 the snowball of goodness begins rolling down the hill as we do good, picking up steam, and then it just plows through the town. That's a terrible illustration. I'm sorry. I did not think that one through fully. But I think you get the idea. Rather than being a destructive force, it's like a snowball of goodness where it spills out over into the world, right? And that's what we heard about. Okay, I'm just trying to make connections. That's what we heard about earlier, right? That it's like we are going to care and build up and we're going to invest our gifts and our talents into this and then it's going to spill out and it's going to expand and it's going to multiply and it's going to make an impact in the world. That's what Paul has in mind. But then he kind of has this really odd part, right, in the middle where he's talking about doing good and, and, and doing good through giving and then just doing good through general goodness at the end. But then he has this part about the flesh and the spirit again here in the middle. What's going on there? He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. This whole passage, Paul has been talking about how to live together as a community. And I don't think that he's changing the subject in these verses either. I think what he's getting at here in these verses is saying how you treat one another, how you do good for one another, how you live in the body. You're either sowing to the flesh or you're sowing to the spirit. You're either doing things in community, which is tearing down the community and making it unhealthy, or you're doing things where you're led by the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit, and then building up the community. And he says, if you're living together in community for the flesh, you'll reap corruption from the flesh. What happens when we live for the flesh in community? What kind of corruption comes about? Alienation, loneliness, divisions, arguments, things like that. That's what you'll reap. If you invest to the flesh in the church, you tear it down and you reap corruption from the, spirit, uh, from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, if you commit to these practices of supporting each other and restoring each other and living out the fruit of the Spirit together, you will reap from the Spirit. And I don't think that Paul is contradicting himself because this whole letter He's upheld that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But then all of a sudden he says, well, if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. I don't think he's contradicting himself. What I think he's saying here is that as you live by the Spirit, as you sow to the Spirit, you are demonstrating that you belong to the church of Jesus. And those that belong to the church of Jesus we receive eternal life. 
because we are his body. And Jesus gives life to his body. We are demonstrating our faith for sowing to the Spirit. What I think these verses also call to mind, though, is this language of sowing and reaping. That's language of gardening or farming, where you sow seeds and then you reap a harvest. Now, many of you have a garden at your home. You're growing the tomatoes, like Dan said, right? And uh, what I think we don't realize, though, is as we drive around the neighborhood or we drive or we pull into the driveway to other people's homes in the church, we, we see their, their gardens, and they look beautiful, right? But uh, when Heather and I lived uh, out in Louisville in our co- apartment complex, there was a community garden. And what we didn't realize is that gardening is a lot of work. It's so much work. You got to get out there and you got to weed like every day because the stuff you want to grow doesn't grow quickly, but everything you don't want to grow grows super fast, right? And you got to get on your hands and knees and individually like pick out the weeds. You got to trim stuff back. You got to water it. You got to fertilize it. Fertilize, fertilize it. You got to do all this stuff, right? But we don't see all the work that goes into it when we pull up to our friends' homes. We just see the beautiful garden. And a lot of times we want this beautiful church. And I'm not talking about the building. We want this beautiful community. But it requires a lot of sowing and a lot of reaping. And what goes into sowing is a lot of pulling weeds, a lot of fertilizing, and a lot of work. It's sowing to the Spirit. And so this means that we need to regularly check ourselves and uproot the selfishness and the pride and the lust and the greed from our own hearts, weed the garden so that the larger garden of the church is beautiful and bearing fruit. We need to get on our hands and knees and get in the dirt of other people's lives and we need to help each other out and bear those burdens, help each other move, help each other learn the Bible, help each other learn how to pray, Help each other learn how to live together in marriage. Help each other how to parent. Help each other how to build relationships and have friendships. Help each other how to overcome anger and how to be free from lust and how to give generously and be free from greed. But if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap eternal life. But the greatest hope that we have in living these things out in this text is the fact that Jesus, he fulfilled these texts on our behalf. If you circle back to verse 1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a spirit of gentleness. That's fulfilled in Jesus because he saw us not just caught in sin, but the Bible describes our condition as being dead in sin, dead, being unable to to obey God, being unable to have any heart or feeling for God. We were like a lifeless corpse on the ground. Jesus saw us in that condition, and he came over to us to restore us. And he restored us in a spirit of gentleness. Jesus came to this earth in humility. When he was about to be crucified, he rode into Jerusalem, not on a war horse, not on a stallion, not proclaiming that his kingdom had come in glory and power at that time, but he came riding into Jerusalem on a humble donkey. And he allowed himself to be falsely accused. He allowed himself to be unjustly tried. He allowed himself to be nailed up on that cross. Why? For you. To restore you. To take on the penalty of your sin, that the trespasses that you were caught in, that you could not save yourself from, he took that on himself. And he did it willingly and gladly. Jesus says, no one takes my life, but I lay my life down. He did that for you. He did that to restore us to a relationship with God. The great chasm that sits between us and God is our sin. And it doesn't matter how much effort we make, it's trying to pole vault over to the Grand Canyon. We would never make it through our own efforts, through our own goodness. But Jesus has bridged that chasm through his death. 
so that he could restore us to God. And when we get restored to God, that is the orienting point so that we can be restored to each other. The only way that we can properly love one another is to love God first. Or more accurately, to have his love poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which comes through faith in Jesus. And so as we love one another, the Bible tells us that our love is sort of like a living, walking icon to the world. It's a living, breathing, communal image of Christ out to the world. Jesus says, the world will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And so the prayer that we need to pray is to have God's love poured out in our hearts so that we can exemplify that love and people can see God's love in how we love each other. And this is a truth which we're going to amplify today in a song of reflection. So I'd invite uh, Maria Merce and Brooke McKenna up. And as the song is sung, we'll have lyrics on the screen that you can meditate on and think about uh, in, in, in thinking through this prayer to the Lord to allow his love to, to shine through us. So with that said, let me pray, and then we'll reflect on this song, and then we'll together as the family of God, we'll sing one final song and be sent. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have sought us, and you have restored us through the, through the cross of Jesus, through his resurrection, and that you have given us the Holy Spirit so we can love one another. I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts a spirit of gentleness, that as we go and we see our brothers and sisters uh, struggling, we would move towards them, that we would seek to see them freed from their sins, Lord, keep us humble and help us to support one another, to sow good things into the community by the power of the Spirit and not things which would tear it down. Keep us humble, keep us in your love, and keep our eyes fixed on Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you.
you stand with us as we finish in song?